Hey, this is Deion Dawkins, man, and you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already know. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Scoop, OwlScoop.com's podcast, Season 9, Episode 26. I am OwlScoop.com editor John DiCarlo. Not quite a full house this week, Kyle Gauss. Couldn't be with us this week, but I am joined by Johnny Zwizlak, Declan Landis, and Ryan Mir Vaughn. A lot of good stuff ahead for you guys. What we hope will be, among other things, kind of an NIL explainer episode. Andrew Hope, an attorney at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney, joined us for what I think and hope will be a very educational interview and conversation that will kind of enlighten all of you. Uh, Again, some of you are really, really up to date and up to speed on NIL. But for those of you who aren't, I think it'll allow you to kind of absorb how we got here, where things may or may not be going with NIL and and the NCAA and all these court cases and legal issues that that come with it. But that'll be a big piece of it. We'll, of course, talk about this Temple women's basketball team that is now tied for first place in the American Athletic Conference standings. The men's team that broke that kind of forgettable, not kind of, very forgettable 10-game losing streak. They won Sunday. They beat UTSA to break that 10-game losing streak. Got a football recruiting update for you as well. Answers to your mailbag questions. The scoop, as always, is brought to you guys by Greenspan and Greenspan Injury Lawyers. If you've been injured while on the road or the highway and the crash was someone else's fault, the insurance company is not going to be on your side. You need us, Temple Law Grads, who will fight hard to get the compensation that you deserve. We only get paid if we win, so in Pennsylvania or New York, call us today at 215-261-7359. That's 215-261-7359. And you can find them on the web at greenspans-law.com. That's greenspans-law.com. Hello, guys. Hello. Hey, John. How you doing, Ramir? What's up? How are you doing? Thanks, Declan. Thanks for joining the conversation. Hey, thanks for having me. You had your mic down for a while. I thought maybe it's like, is he just going to sit this one out? You're in a contract dispute, or? Uh well, we are, but that's for. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. You know, time and place. Time and place. You got. You can talk to Andrew. You can negotiate a new contract. I might, I might have to. <laughs> yeah, like John, this is awkward. But Declan Sorry. reached out to me. <laughs> it's just business. It's not personal. It's, yeah, not personal. Yeah. Business is always personal. Wow, Johnny. That was right. Oh, what a ray of sunshine over there. <laughs> you sound like me. Hey, you're a good influence. Rhyme here is a good influence, right? He really is. Compassionate, right. caring, thoughtful, remembers things, remembers birthdays, remembers things that are important to people. <laughs> what, did, you just, did you just recently, <laughs> wait, did you just recently forget a birthday? Since when do you remember uh, birthdays? I am notorious did for I not sp- remembering things. Did I smoke things. too soon? I'm notorious for not remembering things. I feel it, like you guys are always getting gifts for each other, and you guys are, are good with that stuff. No? It's more spontaneous in the moment for some people. At least it's something. Then, then, you know, I agree. I agree. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. If it's not right in front of me, I'm going to forget every time. <laughs> <laughs> Self-aware. Very. <laughs> are you good at remembering people's birthdays? It depends on how busy I am. Yeah. Famous number 26 is guys. Saquon Barkley. That's that all I know. I know. I have one more. I know what Ramirez's answer is going to be. I'm going to pocket it. Do you? Yeah. Um, the first one that came to my mind was um, Jaquan Jarrett mm. on the Eagles. I don't. I'm not sure if he wore it when he was here. But I don't know if he wore. It. Well, he he eventually was a single digit guy at Temple. But I thought you were going to say Miles Sanders. That was the second one. Yeah. After you said, like, I know who you're going to say, that's what I said. That's what Jaquan I Jarrett's a good I, – I would like to get him on the scoop at some point. He's still in, I believe, a personal position with the Panthers. So he okay. did survive. You know, a lot of the, the Matt Rule guys moved on, but he's still there. He was down at the Senior Bowl recently. He would be an enjoyable guy to talk to. But, yeah, J.J. was a very, very good player. Got put into a box, literally and figuratively, because he was very good box safety. And then Andy Reid at one point said – he, I forget what his exact wording was, but he kind of like loosely compared him to Brian Dawkins. They drafted him in the second round. Probably oh. should have drafted him in the fourth or fifth round. But I still think he was a good player. You know, just not like he wasn't was supposed to be the like start. the savior of the defense, but good player. Emblematic of how Temple recruited back then. He was like a late May edition. Fort Hamilton High School up in New York. Comes in. Comes a really good football player here. Johnny, any 26s? 
the Saquon Barkley was the only one that I had. I, I, I this is the first time where I haven't actually taken a glance at the website prior to the episode. I'll As a guy who works in part for the Phillies organization, number twenty six. Yeah, kind of crazy. I was just thinking this. Come on, Chase Elliott. There we that's, go. That took me way Come too on. long. That took me way too long. They might My fire bad. you. No, because Chase his coworker was, there was pretty cold to him working. on Sunday. Yeah, wait till this so. episode comes out. Yeah, his coworker. <laughs> we talked to, talk to the right people, the Phillies. Yeah, no, that would be pr- that would be kind of brutal because the season's like a little over a month away. Yeah, yeah, and you're you're good at your job. You're adept at understanding the the needs of the players. Yeah, I just I took you a so. sec. Just took you a second on Chase Otley. <laughs> you know, it's a lot going on in the head. Right it's now. cool. He's only don't we all the greatest have second on? baseman. <laughs> in a lot history. going on in the head right now. Save that clip. <laughs> I will. Declan, you say get another one? Uh, Le'Veon Bell. Mm. Oh. I have his jersey. You do? You mm-hmm. have a Le'Veon Bell jersey? I have a couple, like, real... What's the word? Random? Random. Obscure? I guess obscure. obscure. That's the word I was I wouldn't call of. Le'Veon Bell obscure, Not necessarily though. obscure, but, yeah, I can't think of too many people in Philly. It's just kind of random. I was going to say, like, obscure for Rymir. But yeah. For him to have. He likes or was good it football. about... He just you know, was Sorry. he just like one of your favorite running backs growing up? He was. He's my favorite player at one point. Wow. So, and then he just stopped playing. Yeah. Where is he now? Where is Le'Veon Bell now? I have no idea. Probably making raps somewhere. He's a rapper. He's <laughs> on the couch, <laughs> chilling. <laughs> <laughs> or making. He's trying to make an NFL comeback. Or maybe he's making little yeah. raps. Maybe he's just in the health foods now. I, uh, I hope whatever he's doing, he's doing it well because. Ramir, it's your lucky day. <laughs> In addition to Andrew Hope. <laughs> Bug out. Lay, lay, Say Le'Veon Bell. <laughs> Le'Veon Bell joining us on the scoop. No, he's not. Not joining us on the scoop. Any other awesome. any other famous 26s? Somebody want to do trivia? Sure, yeah. I'll play trivia. All right, as Declan was about to say here, as we were preparing this segment, we probably do keep the lights on at Ranker.com. You're welcome. We, we, you, guys have hit, you guys have hit a few of the... The most pertinent ones, although there's a like we're missing on Ranker.com's list number one. We've mentioned him on other episodes because I think he and recently I think he wore another number. Wore this number with the former Washington Redskins. Clint Portis. No. Oh, Clint Portis, I think did wear number twenty six. One of the greatest running backs of all time. Did recently stop playing? What? No. Adrian Peterson. Adrian Peterson wore twenty six. He did. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, Washington. Another Steeler. Get some. Another Steeler, oh, very, very good did. player. Okay. Safety. Steeler? Sorry, I was yes. what? I stopped playing in two thousand three, so you guys were just just kids. Um little little just a wee lad. Man. Can we get a couple more hints? Rod here? Woodson. Rod Woodson, you got Never it. Mind. You got it. You underestimate underestimated right here. Hall of Fame third baseman. I'm cooked. <laughs> played for <laughs> played for the Yankees, the Red Sox, Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Initials are WB. WB? I don't know. WB Mason? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, WB Mason. <laughs> Who but? <laughs> Who but WB Mason? Oh, well, all sorts of free shout outs here. His last name is something similar to a swamp. Marsh. No. You're, oh, you're on the right track. <laughs> oh, it be Boggs, Wade, Wade Boggs. Boggs. There we go. Wade, Wade Boggs. Boggs. Took me a second. Come on, baseball. Maybe on Bell checked in at number four on Ranker.com. Saquon Barley. Saquon Barley. Saquon Barkley. <laughs> um, <laughs> a wheat farmer. <laughs> yeah, that's a wheat farmer. Saquon Barley. <laughs> I guess I guess Daryl Strawberry. They're saying born number twenty six. I don't know if that was when he first broke into the league. Of uh, Daryl Strawberry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the nose. Oh, uh, one of Kyle's. Uh, Kyle has talked about this guy, NBA player. He's talked about him when he went into a barber shop in Muncie, Indiana, or somewhere around that area, and said, "I want my hair to look like this guy." Former Sixer. Oh my goodness. Nets sharpshooter. Kyle Korver. Yes, Kyle yes. Korver. We mentioned Chase Utley. Andrew McCutcheon wore number twenty six. Kyle Korver over Chase Hudley on Ranker.com is crazy. It is. Clinton Portis, number 14 on their list. I'm trying to think of some other trivia, like some guys that you guys will get here. How are you guys on your Minnesota Vikings defensive backs? 
Try Try Vikings, yeah, Bills, three-time Pro Bowler, second-team All-Pro, sub playing in 2013. That's right, in your wheelhouse. His last name is also the name of a, a neighborhood in West Philly. What was the team? Where one half for? of St. Joe's campus is. Vikings and the Bills. His last name is not spelled the way that West Philly spells. It's this neighborhood name. Vikings and Bills. So he's a pro bowler? Yes, three-time pro bowler. Does he have a son? Uh, I don't think I, Brinker gives that information. I don't check out his interest. <laughs> <laughs> Antoine Winfield. That's who I was yes, thinking. Yes. That's, that's who I was thinking. I was gonna say he was the only one who I could think of. Yes, yes. <laughs> Former funny. Flyer Brian Prop. That's for that's for uh, that's for Pat Egan. So I, don't know, I feel like we weren't as sharp on the twenty sixes. We we got off to a bad start once once Johnny was slowing Chase Utley. Yeah, yeah, it was a bad so omen. At the end of the day, it's it's my uh, bad guys. MB. He sold his rose, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be better next time. Hey, you're, you're, next you're the time. one that has to go in the clubhouse. We're all you know, day by we're, day. We're fine. We're all day by day. Yeah. You're not going to win them all. No, you definitely not. You got your good days, you got your bad days, you got your in-between days. Exactly. Just got to get 1% better. 1%. Get bigger, faster, bigger, faster, stronger. Faster, stronger. <laughs> Would you say, are you a guy that stacks ba- days, Johnny? Do you guys like, do you stack days? Oh, I do. Do you got Declan, are you a day stacker? I don't even know what that means, to be honest with you. Stacking days? Stacking days. One of the big Temple football was a big like Jeff Collins talked about it. Deion okay. Dock and stacking days. Do you that like use your context dog. clues? What do you think stacking days means? Uh, it means you know, good days one after the other. There you go. It's the same thing. as one percent better. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I get. See, we're we're the new generation. You know, we get back to basics and fundamentals. We we're getting bigger, faster, stronger. Everybody's day to day. You know, we we've got different terms. Declan that Landis like stubbed his toe. He's day to day. Day to day. You know, Declan Landis ate a bad batch of Taco Bell. He stayed a day. <laughs> Never happened. None. <laughs> Johnny Swizlak on the 15 day disabled list after eating a TGI Fridays. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Don't bring up TGI Friday. <laughs> That's crazy. That was your fault. Did not play coach's decision. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Swizlak. Yeah. Threw up three times. <laughs> He's back at home just getting some fluids. Missed, <laughs> missed half of the iron claw because <laughs> he was in the bathroom. I did. Up. <laughs> That's for another time. Another time. Like I said at the outset of the episode, we're happy to play this conversation that I had here with Andrew Hope, an attorney at Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney. Uh, he'll, he'll tell you here that he's not an NIL expert per se, but he has written about this for Law.com, written about the intersection, as I said, of law and sports and uh, all the recent developments in, in the NIL landscape that we're still keeping up with and how... The NCAA has kind of had one foot in, one foot out on this whole thing, and it's been kind of dizzying at times to follow. So, again, we wanted this to be kind of an NIL explainer episode for everybody. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this and be a little bit more educated uh, after this. So we'll have this interview here with Andrew Hope and, of course, have more for you on the other side. We are excited to have with us on The Scoop this week Andrew Hope. He's an attorney at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. He's written about the intersection of law and sports and recent developments in the NIL landscape, and there have been plenty of them, of course. And what we're really hoping to do here for all of you is have this be a bit of an NIL explainer episode because there's so much to it. And some of you who may be listening, you know that NIL and the transfer portal have have really kind of turned college athletics upside down. But most of us who are not lawyers like Andrew is – uh, can't really always explain to the best of our ability how we got here. So, Andrew, really, really appreciate you doing this. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Um, no I do I do want to make clear, I am a commercial litigator by trade. So I handle breach of contract, uh, business towards consumer defense type work. But this has been an interest of mine dating back to my time in law school, really, which is when a lot of these issues really started to percolate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have written about this, you wrote about this in law.com and you do, I mean, you have, and I would highly recommend reading Andrew's piece in law.com because it's a lot of the the talking points that we're going to be addressing here. You can find in his, in his article, but you, you do have a good understanding of this and we really appreciate you being on Andrew, just to start off, you know, tell us how we, we got here. You know, as you wrote about in that story, this dates back to 2009 with the Ed O'Bannon and EA Sports thing that eventually involved a $40 million settlement and things have kind of just gradually built from there. 
So that was the seminal decision. Um, you know, the, everyone remembers the 1994, 1995 UCLA basketball team with, with Ed O'Bannon when they won the national championship. But for years, you, you had EA Sports licensing these video games for football and basketball, where I don't think they used the player names, but they used like the numbers. And it was very clear who these players were. You could match them to the rosters. Uh, and their image and likeness was being licensed without any sort of um, compensation. And Ed O'Bannon and a class of former college athletes brought an action against EA Sports and the NCAA. And, and EA Sports wisely settled it quickly for $40 million. And the NCAA pursued it in litigation through trial, through appeal, up through the Supreme Court, uh, where they ultimately lost and were forced to pay $42 million worth of, of damages and attorney's fees. And that started, that basically opened Pandora's box as far as, you know, these actions. All of them, this one, you know, not an exception, are brought under federal antitrust laws, which basically, you know, are, are, are requiring or, you know, kind of hold the NCAA potentially liable for requiring member institutions to agree not to compensate student athletes. Um, that is, you know, illegal like collaboration. Um, and, and, and that's why you see all of these cases arise under federal antitrust laws. And then later on, this is where Alston payments are rooted in, correct? Where the and the American Athletic Conference was involved. And the, I mean, sometimes I think fans, if they read about it, they see it as another supplemental source of money. It's not the same as a cost of attendance stipend. It's a different thing. But isn't this where all, the Alston payments kind of come along as well? Yeah, so you saw you saw after the O'Bannon decision, which was eventually resolved in, in 2014, I think, um, the the sort of steady drip and expansion of these lawsuits, where you're seeing um, plaintiffs come up with with new theories uh, and, and and new challenges to the restrictions, and so Alston was really a, a consolidation of, of several actions, and, and you'll see this you know throughout the the landscape of the litigation where uh, athletes are. are purported classes of athletes will bring cases and then they're ultimately consolidated usually in the Northern District uh, for Calif of California, uh, which tends to be the most plaintiff friendly liberal sort of, um, you know, federal court. Um, and so Allison, I think Sean Allison, I think was a football player for West Virginia, but there was a, a lot of uh, other, you know, plaintiffs who were involved in this consolidated action. Um, some of whom I believe were uh, AAC athletes, but the Allison case focused on essentially non-cash benefits and, and what the restrictions on those were. And that, that included, I think, computer, computers, uh, musical instruments, uh, and, and this is a quote, other tangible items not included in the cost of attendance calculation, but nonetheless related to the pursuit of academic studies. That is the, the key phraseology uh, from the court. And essentially, the, the NCAA challenged that ruling, specifically the definition of what benefits, quote, related to education was. That's ambiguous, they argued. And they said that essentially because it was ambiguous, it was subject to potential abuse and could create a pay for play program, which is what the NCAA has been sort of litigating against for decades. And the Supreme Court rejected this argument. In, in a unanimous decision. The Supreme Court is very rarely unanimous, but in 2021, all nine of them agreed uh, that the NCAA was wrong and, and that these payments should be covered and, and in fact are covered. And in sort of typical NCAA fashion, it negotiates through litigation. And so June 21st, I think, was the, was the ruling in 2021. And then literally days after that, the NCAA um, published its, its first NIL policy. So you know, from there, things have continued to expand. And that was the kind of the tipping point that got us to where we are today. You know, that the NIL, the NIL policy from the NCAA was was issued in June of 2021. And then states quickly started passing NIL legislation. Pennsylvania was the first among them, I believe, J July 1st, 2021 was its first uh, uh, piece of legislation, which is Senate Bill 381. And to further educate our listeners on this, and I think a lot of people do know this but for those who don't and might be hearing about this for the first time what can universities and their athletic departments do and not do in terms of working with collectives what can they do and not do for collectives and student athletes sure so th that is a bit of a gray area um and the ncaa has been lobbying congress for a federal uh solution to this a comprehensive nil bill that would preempt states from from legislating in this area and not one of these bills 
has made it out of committee. I think you have a dozen or so that have been proposed, but there's no traction here at the federal level. And as a result, states are free to legislate in this area and all of them virtually have. Um, and so you have conflicts uh, between you know, state laws and what they permit um, for in-state institutions. And you have conflicts um, with what the NCA permits. Uh, and in fact, a lot of these statutes not only allow things that the NCAA does not allow, but in fact, prohibits in-state institutions from cooperating with NCAA enforcement actions. So um, that has kind of driven things to a bit of a head where um, in, in June of 2023, you had a, uh, a memo come out uh, from the NCAA, um, the uh, executive vice president of regulatory affairs, this guy named Stan Wilcox issued this memo that instructed met, uh, member institutions to essentially ignore uh, state laws, permissive state laws that conflict with NCA regulations. And, and, and that's a pretty bold move um, to basically tell, to tell you know, universities not to, uh, not to abide by state law. Um, and, and specifically, you know, what were, was considered permissive as opposed to mandatory was, was not addressed in this memo. And that, you have to think that that's by design. Yeah, and, and that kind of gets to like this central theme that's going to keep coming up in our conversation where it's like this, you know, like there's like the little thing where like people pointing fingers in two different ways where it's just like one foot in, one foot out. And it, it just, a lot of this, I think, stems from the NCAA kind of just trying to pass the buck and then saying, oh, but wait, but wait. And there are, of course, problems that come with enforcing all of this. And can you kind of go into the Johnny Weiss situation down at Miami and, and what you know, your impression of that and explaining that to listeners too? So, I mean, this is a, you know, very typical of the NCAA um, where uh, so far as I know, through the end of 2023, there's been a single N NIL penalty imposed for violation of, of the uh, NCAA policy. And it was against the University of Miami women's basketball team. Um, and so um, the specific violation dealt with recruitment of the, the Cavender twins who, you know, some listeners might know, or, or you know, kind of these social media sensations uh, who, who played their first three years at Fresno State and eventually transferred to Miami um, and were involved with uh, John Ruiz, who was a booster at Miami and his company Life Wallet, um, and were offered uh, what I believe the NCAA termed uh, improper inducements to, to join the, NC, the Miami women's basketball team. Uh, as a result, uh, Miami's head coach, uh, Kate Meyer, was susp suspended for three games and, and the program was placed on probation for a year, you know, sacrificing um, uh, on-campus visits and, and things like that. Um, but the Cavender twins, who are the players, were not sanctioned and nor was John Ruiz. Um, now, John Ruiz is, is famous for some other things, too. He's, he's famous for negotiating that $800,000 NIL deal, which brought Nigel Pack over from Kansas State. Um, now, that was not the subject of any NCAA enforcement action. Um, now John Ruiz has also been uh, the subject of, of a DOJ investigation for, for SEC violations. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of where he lives right now, but it, it is all a way for the NCA to kind of gesture at this notion that we are going to police this, um, but how aggressively and against whom are sort of open questions. The threat of enforcement is oftentimes much more powerful than actual enforcement, as, as you'll see. Yeah, you've got, when we've talked about it, like prior to this, is that what, when you're referring to like this danger of half measures, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, that, that is sort of another issue as well. This, this idea that the NCAA has kind of refused to confront this seriously um, and is, is looking to kind of, you know, negotiate through litigation or as a result of litigation. Well, kind of like Wiley Coyote, they always lose. Um, and, and, and so negotiating in that way is, is not particularly, you know, helpful, I don't think. It slows things down, but it also kind of re results in a lot of these sort of band-aids, temporary type measures, which lead to, um, I guess, confusion, um, gray areas, because uh, that's what really programs and players want is, you know, what are we allowed to do? And, and, and you know, as an administration, you want to know what's allowed, what's not. Um, obviously, there will always be, be people and programs who push the boundaries, but I think by and large, um, yeah, everyone wants to comply, but nobody knows exactly what compliance means in sort of this ever shifting landscape. Uh, and the NCA is, is in, responsible for that um, because they, they for years kind of held up, you know, this amateurism 
model and and and, and kind of the, the threat to to amateurism and and the, the the threat of inducements and pay for play was this boogeyman well you know it, it is it always has existed whether or not it's been allowed um number one but number two they've tried to kind of address it you know, as you mentioned through these half measures, like, oh, well, let's tweak the transfer rules. Let's do this and that. Well, you know, eventually all these band-aids, you know, don't do the job. And the, you know, the, the, the march towards pay for play is inequitable. And so now you have a very kind of uh, uncertain, destabilized environment where you have like the freedom to transfer, where you have, you know, payments to players which are permitted. And it, it kind of is almost like perpetual free agency. And then we can look back at September when it was found the former Florida star Jervon Dexter eventually becomes a second round pick of the Bears and signed an NIL deal that, that violated a state NIL law in place at the time. And then the result of this is that he's ultimately going to have to owe about $1 million back of his first NFL contract to this big league advance fund. What's your, what's your view of that? Just more of what can happen with the way the landscape is? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I look at this as sort of a, a failure of oversight. Um, so to kind of provide a, a bit of bit of a bit of background, uh, while he was still a player at Florida, uh, Jervon Dexter signed this deal with Big League Advance or you know, Big League Advance Fund, uh, and it, and essentially it was it was a deal for a one time payment of about four hundred thousand dollars in exchange for fifteen percent of his earnings at the next level for fifteen years. Like that's not a contract that anyone ought to sign. But when you don't, you know, have a, a ready source of income in college, that's something that an, an 18 or 19 or 20 year old might sign. Um, and so it, it was signed before Florida amended its NIL statute. So this is, it's just, you know, the challenge to this, you know, I'm sure there's, I haven't looked at the lawsuit itself. I'm sure there's an unconscionability argument, this, this sense that this contract shouldn't be enforced because it's just too onerous. Um, but there's this retroactive application of Florida's amended statute. So he signed the deal in 2022. Florida amended its statute in 2023. And he's saying, well, under the new statute, my contract is now void. That's a novel legal argument. I'll be interested to see how it pans out. But, but if nothing else, it kind of highlights the need for you know, cooperation between athletic departments and student athletes to kind of prevent abuse like this and, and potential predatory NIL deals. Yeah, and this is this almost seems like the case. And again, like I feel like either coaches or athletic directors or talking heads who kind of want to lean on this a little bit, lean in on this a little bit and say, yeah, I don't know if this is always a good thing. Something like this comes up and they say, wow, like this is this is the, the, the bad side of it. And then you mentioned earlier that the, the memo that the NCAA released back in June, essentially, yeah, saying that schools have to follow NCAA rules, even if they conflict with state laws. And again, Getting back to like the central theme of what we're talking about, it just seems like a another mess. So that I mean, that's a bad approach in general. Um, but then compound that with the fact that there's no explanation as to what what permissive state laws are, right? It's it's this I think purposeful cloud that the NCA is kicking up. And again, it's the idea that, in my opinion, the threat of enforcement is the way that they want to try to keep players and programs in line. And I just don't think that that's helpful to anyone. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, you see the issues with, with trying to enforce this. I don't know if, if, if you're familiar with the, the university of Tennessee football team and, and there was recruiting violations under Jeremy Pruitt when he was there and the penalty just came down last fall. And so the AG of, of the attorney general of Tennessee, this guy named John Scrimetti, uh, many believe was sort of instrumental in ensuring that the NCAA penalties imposed were relatively tame and specifically did not include any sort of postseason ban. And the reason that, you know, many believe that no postseason ban was included was because John Scrimetti said to the NCAA, if you do this, I will sue you. Um, it is violative of our state laws, our state NIL laws, and I will sue you. And so this threat of litigation, many believe, um, tempered the penalties. Well, turns out, you know, John Scrimetti ended up suing the NCAA anyway. Um, he and the AG of, of Virginia just brought uh, an action in the Eastern District of Tennessee seeking a preliminary injunction uh, against the NCAA for enforcement of its NIL rules, uh, in part because they're confusing and they're harmful to athletes. 
And so that was just argued at a hearing last week. Um, and I expect, given the procedural posture, specifically that injunctive relief is being requested, you'll get a relatively quick ruling. I don't think we have one yet. Uh, and that's not a final determination, but it could in the short term um, shape whether or not the NCA can actually enforce its own NIL policy. And what it sounds like the simple follow up question, but if that is the case, then is that better? Is that worse? Or does this make things more murky? Hard to say. Right. I mean, that that's like really the problem here is like, OK, you know, nobody knows what what the actual sort of outer bounds of the policy entails. I don't want to say no one knows, but uh, presumably the NCAA knows. But the NCAA has not been particularly forthright in communicating that. Um, and like a lot of statutes and, and laws, um, you know, you they, those are sort of refined through enforcement, through litigation and, and, and NCAA enforcement. And so there's necessarily some, you know, gray areas in, in any sort of statutory framework. But the NCAA has, seems to have, you know, specifically embraced this nebulous approach to kind of threaten people to comply because nobody knows exactly what's not allowed. Uh, and I just don't think that that is a very helpful regime. No, that sounds like it. And then there's the the Charlie Baker proposal from December. And I think when that first came to light, I think a lot of people thought, okay, here we have it. This might ultimately create even more of a divide between the haves and the have nots. And, and part of that, the wording from his proposal <laughs> Was that how and when athletes would be would access money from this revenue sharing plan would be left up to the schools and what 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 clarity can you bring to that and how you see that turning out because it seems like you know and again the the vague thing it seems like charlie baker left it vague to be done quote unquote within the framework of title nine as if that's going to be really easy for schools to hash out uh, again it's very consistent uh, for many reasons the ones that you just pointed out and the additional reason that this proposal is a direct result of another adverse ruling from the Ninth Circuit. Um, there's a case pending right now called House v. NCAA, um, which potentially puts the NCAA and the Power Five conferences on the hook for up to $4 billion worth of damages. And so that was appealed. Uh, there was a class certification, which was granted, which is, again, um, when you have a, a purported class action, there are certain requirements that the plaintiffs have to meet. Um, to establish that the case can be sort of um, efficiently resolved via class action as opposed to individual actions. And class certification is a very important, you know, stage of the litigation. It is an inflection point where a lot of cases are either dismissed or settled. And so class certification was granted, guess where? Uh, they were in the District of California. Um, and then the NCAA took the, what many believe, or can many, many consider the extraordinary step of appealing class certification. So generally, when you appeal a, a case, you have to wait until the final resolution uh, of, the, of the case, essentially at the end of trial, or if the case is dismissed, you can appeal you know, at that point. Here, you you're seeking essentially what's called an interlocutory appeal, uh, a, a sort of an intermediate appeal while the case is still technically ongoing because it's such a momentous decision. And the you know likelihood of that getting overturned um, is, you know, very minimal. Uh, and particularly when you consider you're appealing to the Ninth Circuit, it is virtually, you know, non-existent. Uh, and in fact, the NCA lost that appeal. And so class certification was upheld. And following that, you have this proposal by Charlie Baker, which is the sort of most aggressive step toward a pay-for-play model that the NCA has ever embraced. Now, again, this is not actual policy yet. This is just proposal. Um, but, you know, the, you're, you're seeing the kind of theme here where the NCA litigates these issues, they lose, and then they react. And, and so this is just another step. Um, as, you know, consistent with its prior approaches, too, you have this, you know, very sort of sketchy outline as to what it is looking to accomplish here, uh, leaving it to the discretion of the schools. And do you see it, again, this might fall into the hard to say category, but do you see that actually happening or no? It is really hard to say. Uh, I mean, the argument on appeal, it was amusing to some because the argument was essentially, well, we could go bankrupt. Um, nobody wants that. Um, generally not an argument that defendants make on appeal, um, but really this is more of a policy argument than a legal argument um, from the NCAA at this point. Uh, and they kind of box themselves in here. It, you know, the, the issue is these are, they are on the wrong side of antitrust law here. 
and the NCA has not really meaningfully, in my opinion, engaged with the legal realities and is now in this position where, you know, it has painted itself into this corner. Then you have the, there's a situation at Dartmouth where the National Labor Relations Board ruled that Dartmouth's 15 players are employees of the school, which means they're eligible to vote on whether to unionize and they're going to have a March 5th union election. So it's coming up soon. If they have a yes majority vote, they would then become the first unionized team in college sports. Kate Haskins said he hopes will encourage other teams and other programs to take the same action. So <laughs> what happens if that happens? Do players start signing contracts that can include buyouts, non-competes, other things that could be more of a hindrance to them that they may even realize at this point? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am a commercial litigator and not a labor attorney, so I'm far from an expert here. Um, but from a broad perspective, uh, you know, this would give the Dartmouth basketball team collective bargaining rights, which means that they could negotiate things like compensation and working conditions. So practice time, travel, things like that. Um, as far as, you know, could they bind themselves to uh, non-competes? I suppose, I, I suppose they could. Um, would that actually be enforced? I don't know. This is really uncharted territory. You know, for years, the one thing that has been consistent, notwithstanding the um, the uh, um, antitrust sort of victories, is that the NCAA, NCAA athletes were not employees. And in fact, that was sort of a key component of the proposed legislation that the NCAA was, was seeking at the federal level, a definitive determination that NCAA athletes are not employees. Um, you had a, a, a sort of a, an abortive attempt by the Northwestern football team a couple of years ago, which failed. Um, but this this is brought in New Hampshire and not in Illinois. And so you have, you know, and again, this is not, you know, this is not a court decision. You have a representative from the National Labor Relations Board essentially allowing this to, you know, kind of, you know, proceed. So it is not, you know, it does not have the same level of sort of seriousness as, as a legal decision of a court of law. Um, you know, there might be litigation that results, you know, following this, but it, it goes to show you that there, you know, the, the framework is somewhat unworkable given the, the different jurisdictions uh, and the differing interpretations that you're going to see in jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, to me, you know, to the extent you want to preserve the end, preserve the NCAA. Um, I think it would probably be helpful to have some sort of comprehensive statutory framework, framework, but Congress hasn't acted and does not appear inclined to act anytime soon. So this is, you know, this piecemeal approach is what you're left with. You and I talked about this, and there's obviously a lot of fear and trepidation that comes with the new and the unknown with this, but you see this as a win-win for student athletes in universities, right? Because there's a lot of education that can take place. And if, if this were to progress in the right direction, you could allow athletes to, to you know, profit and share in revenue generated from universities. It, it could bring some, I think it kind of already has, we're about some parity leveling the playing field between the haves and have nots where, hey, if you have, I mean, look at what SMU has been able to do. I mean, it's not all NIL related, but you know, if you've got some money, you've got some donors, like, hey, we can try to work our way into the ACC. And you know, it, it could also, again, easy for me to say because I don't work in compliance, but it could lead from more educational opportunities for oversight from universities and athletic departments. You, can you talk about that, too? Because I think, like, I feel like you see, like, a path forward for this. I know I'm kind of, like, waving a magic wand with this, but you see it as a win-win, potentially. I do. I think it's understandable that a lot of people look at this as sort of a purely distributive negotiation. One side's gain is the other side's loss. And I, I think as someone who loves sports and education, I think it's an extremely flawed view. Um, I think the academic and athletic missions of a university should go hand in hand. And I think it makes for a more satisfying campus environment and provides an easy way for alumni to stay connected uh, and involved uh, in, in fundraising. Um, so by working cooperatively on NIL issues, I think there's a way that universities and athletes can both profit in a way that is, you know, that truly is win-win. You know, Dean Smith was one who said it years ago, athletics can be the front porch of the university. I know that sometimes that can really upset some, some pure academics, but you know, when teams do well, it does. It, we, a lot of what we're talking about here is generating revenue for universities and the athletes, but it can, it can boost enrollment. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you see that locally. I mean, we joke around that those new dorms on on Lancaster Avenue, those are all, um, you know, that that's money that that J, that Jay Wright brought into to Villanova. 
Um, and, and I guess the other thing that I would say is, you know, from a, um, you know, an equitable perspective, athletes who help generate revenue for the, their universities, you know, probably ought to be able to share in that, right? This is, a, this is you know, a multi-billion dollar industry now. And at the same time, at the same time, this pay for play model that the NCAA has been sort of, you know, worried about has existed for decades, just sort of anonymously and under the table. And as you kind of mentioned, by bringing it out in the open, you can at least try to ensure parity and help laying level the playing field. Um, and at the same time, you can provide a, a level of oversight um, from universities and athletic departments to make sure that these 18 and 19 year old kids are not being taken advantage of uh, and that they're not associating themselves with companies or, or products that, you know, the university or alumni might find uh, distasteful. Uh, so it, there really is an opportunity for everyone to kind of row in the same direction here. Um, and I think that the negotiations to this point have been sort of disappointing in, in, in the sense that they don't fully embrace those opportunities. It, it just recently, uh, Colorado State just announced that its AD Joe Parker is going to take a step back from his position. And he's going to serve as a special advisor of their president. He's going to be succeeded on an interim basis by John Weber, who is the executive director of their Rams focused Green and Gold Guard Collective, which is their main collective. I don't know if they have others. Now, that's certainly an interesting model, but it shows you that university athletic departments are dedicating specific roles and resources to NIL. Like, there are guys that are in chief of staff positions, Lynn Greer here at Temple. Um, it's not fully NIL focused, but partially at St. Joe's and Villanova. And, and again, it shows you that university athletic departments are, are really kind of saying, okay, we, we have to adapt or we're going to be left behind. Uh, are programs going to have to start doing stuff like this to stay viable and stay current, kind of like dovetailing into what we were just talking about? Do you feel like <clears throat> maybe my question is like, are you surprised that people have been slower to adapt or is it just, just go back to that fear of the unknown? And now they're saying like, we, we have to start getting a real good handle on what we can do and not do to stay viable. Um, I see both sides of this argument. Um, just my legal background, I have an appreciation for compliance and box checking and a conservative approach. Um, I understand why that is sort of the knee-jerk reaction for a lot of people in compliance. I don't think it's the right approach here, <laughs> um, personally. And I think you're right. I think it is inevitable that you, you, you know, and universities are doing themselves a disservice by not pursuing this, not saying they need to pursue it recklessly, um, but they need to pursue it seriously, uh, because this is where everyone is headed and you're going to get left behind. It, there's there's no magic wand for this as we've been talking about and you've kind of touched on a lot of this already but if you personally Andrew Hope could go back in time what would have been the ideal way for all this to play out and be so less messy than it is now I'd have to think that a lot of the onus here goes back on the NCAA what would you what would you have done I, I think once it became obvious the amount of money that college sports could generate um, that the NCAA should have faced the realities earlier, uh, rather than making sort of these ill-fated attempts to forestall what many believe was inevitable, right? You're on the wrong side of the of antitrust law here. Um, and it just, you know, it's a matter of time before the pay-for-play model is, you know, you know, fully sanctioned. And so rather than taking, you know, these half measures like, you know, tweaking the transfer rules, um, you know, if anything, those, you know, sort of changes made things worse now in the sense that there's a level of sort of instability that nobody seems prepared for now that NIL is on the table. And I think, you know, if you put, you know, you rewind to, to 2009, you know, to look at that as a one-off decision, I think was incredibly short-sighted. Um, these, you know, plaintiff's attorneys are really smart um, and they understand the sort of incremental progress that was available to them. And the NCAA didn't or refused to acknowledge it. And, and this is sort of where we are as a result. We have a, a mailbag question here from one of our subscribers. This is a screen name from one of our Alscoop subscribers. The screen name is Matt Deebs. And it relates it. It's geared to you. And it, it, it's uh, toward, you know geared to what we're talking about. The question is, what does college sports look like five years from now? I know it's an impossible question, but it seems like so much of this is unsustainable. <laughs> to me, the big schools are going to get burned more and more, but have enough cash to keep going. And everyone else will be struggling to stay afloat. I know that's an opinion that a lot of people have. Is that... 
part of what you see? Or again, it sounds like you on the other hand might be a little bit more solutions focused with this. I guess I'm like an optimist at heart. And I really do like what the NCAA is supposed to stand for. And I love college athletics. And I frankly dislike all the conference realignment. Um, and I, I understand why it is happening. And I wish it weren't. Um, five years from now, yeah, I mean, you're seeing this arms race and you're seeing the haves and the have nots. And, and as we've talked about before, what is it? Roughly a dozen college programs are actually profitable. Um, I, I do think at this point, it almost makes sense to carve out football for a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, the amount of money, the amount of, of travel, um, you know, the, the number of scholarships makes Title IX compliance virtually impossible. You know, like, what is it, 85 scholarships um, to kind of, you know, um, and, and all the money that goes into the, those programs. And for some of those programs, they fund the entire athletic department. So it makes sense. But, you know, I, I see this increasing professionalization, particularly of college in college football, that is just not sustainable for the vast majority of universities. So if five years from now, if you told me that, you know, a certain number of power five schools had broken away and formed their own sort of semi-professional league, yeah, I, I would I would not be shocked. Um, I don't know that this current model is sustainable. Um, I don't know if it will be five years or ten years, but certainly something has to change and change significantly. And I and I think you can kind of almost you know sever college football from that conversation because it's just so you know unique. Um, but from a larger perspective, there have to be pretty significant changes. And I don't know that the NCAA to this point has demonstrated any sort of, you know, seriousness uh, in, in acknowledging that future. Now, and th this is great stuff, Andrew. We appreciate pers your perspective on this. In the interest of full disclosure, not only is Andrew a very successful, knowledgeable lawyer, he's also my first cousin. So he was always the most of, of between my brother, Jeff and I, and Jeff goes to St. Joe's, I go to Temple. Andrew comes along, goes to Devon Prep, goes to UVA for an undergrad, and then goes to Columbia for law school. So we feel about this big at, at this point. Good looking guy to boot, great wife, great daughter. But he's a big, big UVA basketball fan. You have seen both ends of it where your team has won a national championship and they also lost to a 16 seed, which I know was hell for you. I remember texting you on night, like, sorry, buddy. But they're they're good again this year. But what what happened to them last night? They don't like they haven't won what's it, like four years in a row now down at Virginia Tech, right? Um, I think actually won they might have won last year, but they always struggle in Blacksburg. Uh, the record there the last few years is 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 pretty poor. Maybe two years ago they won. I think it might have been two years ago because the team was not good, but they somehow won that game. Um I think um, you know, the um you know, they're they're the floor is very low for this year's team. Uh, and frankly, there is a you know, the 2016 recruiting class, which won that national championship. Uh, which featured Philadelphia's own DeAndre Hunter. Um, you know, there has been difficulty in replicating that. And there were four straight abysmal recruiting classes. And I do think a program like Virginia that is sort of built on um, finding under the radar recruits and developing them over three to four years, that model is, is more difficult to sustain in the current environment where you have the freedom to transfer, where you have NIL money, where programs like, you know, Virginia is, are, are not as uh, enthusiastic about it. Um, there are, I think our donors who are willing to participate, but our coach is, is not someone who subscribes to that sort of model. And our university is, you know, full of hand ringers um, who are, you know, very interested in preserving the reputation of Mr. Jefferson's university. So um, I think those are all difficulties that this year's team, and frankly, you know, we haven't won a, a postseason game. Well, we haven't won a, an NCAA tournament game since 2019. Um, so it's been a while. And, um, you know, I think it's a combination of limited uh, athletic ability, lim you know, not, not enough shooters, uh, and then just trying to kind of come to terms with this, this new landscape. 
But they've got some. They like their their backcourt's made up of some top one fifty guys, right? And they've got well, so so, and that's the other thing. Some of this it has been the result of of pieces not really fitting together that well. Reese Beekman, I think, is an NBA prospect. Um, I I think he you know may go at the end of the first round, likely in the second round this year, but not not really a shooter. Um, sort of a, a long old school type point guard, really really good defender, really good ball handler, distributor, just not a consistent deep threat um and, and that sort of you know forces the the offense into some suboptimal situations uh, isaac mcneely is a sophomore player who looks like he's promising he's a top 150 guy who, who played in the same system uh for his high school in west virginia and you know he he has shown some ability but um there's just not enough talent around him to distract uh, opposing defenses. And so he tends to invite a lot of attention. I think he's shooting like 45% from three this year, which is fantastic. But, you know, the quality of looks is just not there for him because there's just such limited talent, particularly offensively in in the rest of the lineup. Ryan Dunn is someone who folks mentioned might be, you know, a lottery pick this year. And I am just not seeing that level of ability. Um, And so Part of it is just pieces not fitting together. Part of it is re- recruiting misses and, and lack of development. We had, you know, two pretty key transfers uh, go out this year. Um, Caden Shedrick went to Texas. Um, he was a very athletic five man who was, you know, defensive presence and, and, and featured some offensive ability, offensive rebounding, things like that. And the other was this guy, Isaac Trout, who was, who came in as a, as a first year last year and red shirted uh, and then just transferred to Creighton. And he's like, seeing about, you know, five, eight minutes a game there, but he was a stretch four who, who would have really fit well with this offense given the time to develop, but we're just not seeing that level of stability uh, on the roster. And we're not seeing the sort of development that, you know, we've come to sort of appreciate under, under coach Bennett. So uh, I don't know what, you know, what the next years bring. I, I'm, I'm always sort of hopeful, um, but it's just, uh, it's been a difficult time since 2019. I'll say that much. No. They're in a battle. They're they're in a still fairly good position right now compared to you know four, talking four guys who cover Temple, but well, yeah, I no, I I understand it, and again, this is all as as tough as it's been since 2019. This is by far the best stretch of, of Virginia basketball probably in anyone's lifetime. So it's difficult to complain too much. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it's one of those things where. Um, you know, y- y- if you have a good coach and you have a good culture, you kind of cross your fingers and, and deal with the rest because there's only kind of a handful of programs um, that can kind of do it year in and year out. Andrew, final question for you. If you had to explain, I, I miss my dad. I love him. Your uncle. If you had to explain to him what a podcast is at this point, I used to vaguely explain it to him. I think he got it. Could you imagine what would your conversation with Big John be like right now? I'll say, hey, John and I recorded a podcast today. How, how would that go? What sort of follow up questions would he have? Oh, I don't, you know, I, I can't even begin um, to, to kind of guess at what your dad might ask. I know, you know, technology was not necessarily a strong suit, but I do know that he is someone who supported, you know, his family and their endeavors 100%, regardless of whether or not he understood them. So I'm sure he would be very proud that you organized this podcast and that I managed to appear on. We, he would get, we, some of us would get a forwarded text message. And we would say you are the only person with like a 1978 flip phone who could who could pull that off at this point. Yeah, that, that, yeah, Big John was a was a character, and um, you know, I'll never forget. He, you know, he recorded Christmas music from the 1980s, and uh, we would listen to it when we put up Christmas lights. It was always yeah. a blast. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, but it's been very fun, very educational. Hopefully, we can do this again at some point. All right, thanks for having me on. All right, big thank you to Andrew Hope. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that, and hopefully, it was in enjoyable and educational for all of you because we're going to keep talking about it and I not going anywhere as we all know guys this temple women's basketball team we've talked about how inconsistent they've been but now they pieced together with three wins in a row right and they are now the team that was picked ninth in the preseason coaches poll as of February 20th is now tied for first place in the American Athletic Conference standings, looking like they're in real good shape to get that double bye, which would be huge in the conference tournament. Let's talk about this win that they had over Tulane last night. We're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. You guys were there last night. Consistency, again, we talk about it constantly. 
they were, I guess, more dominant in beating Tulane the first time around. I guess the game really kind of got, like, I guess, comfortable for them in the fourth quarter last night. But uh, tell us tell us what you saw from last night because this is an exciting time as of now. Again, they've still got some regular season games left. But an exciting time for Diane Richardson's program, an exciting time for this team as they start to really, you know, again, they they wouldn't get into the NCAA tournament as an at-large, but we can tangibly say now that they're, and I think we've been saying for a few weeks, they look like the team that could beat anybody, beat anybody, excuse me, and lose to anybody, but now they're starting to click. What's been the difference? I know there probably could be a few things, but what it, you guys cover them as well as anybody. What, what have you seen that has helped them for now turn the corner? I think the biggest thing is defense. You know, we saw it in the first quarter. It was really slow. They couldn't really get things going. And then the second quarter kind of picked up, and the reason that it picked up was their defense picked up, their communication picked up. And then that led to more comfort on the offensive end because they it felt like their confidence went up knowing that they could get stops, that you know it took the pressure off on the other end, that they didn't have to get buckets because they were making these stops on defense. And then in the second half, they just looked very, very comfortable. I really like – you mentioned – it didn't look like as big of a blowout. It felt like a blowout. It didn't feel for a second like Tulane was coming back in that game. And I think that's the level of comfort this team needs where, yes, they, they struggled at times on offense. They still you know, don't look great in half-court sets. They're still forcing shots at times. But their defense has just been so like, good in picking up their production on the offensive end that it doesn't seem to matter. And if they can continue that – that's really been their strength this season. That's what gives them an opportunity to compete, you know, while we're in Fort Worth. So, I mean, we'll see what happens, but that's the kind of win where you're like, ah, it's, you know, on paper, maybe it doesn't look as good, but you're in the arena, you're watching this team. Like, this is a very, very dangerous team. No, I think you're 100% right, Declan. I think the, the other How thing often about, do you hear that from Johnny, Declan? Uh, more often than you think. Okay. I, no need to get cocky. I'm just yeah, asking. I'm just saying. I'm throwing that out there. Yeah, Johnny, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, it was, it, it's good. It's okay. I, um, <laughs> I think being in the arena, like you mentioned, Declan, one thing that you'll you'll notice, like just watching them play, is like how close they are and how close knit they are as a team. And I mean, it showed if if you watch the the post game video that on alscoop dot com uh, alscoop underscore com on YouTube, you could see that it was all four all all, all five of the starters were in there. He's just the, telling people where to go. Dad. I was just telling where to just go. Made me laugh yeah. the way he said it. I'm sorry. I'm I'm just I'm just <laughs> trying to make sure the people com. know where to go. So alscoop and percent com. <laughs> um, sorry, I just, buddy, go I, ahead. I think the they brought all five starters in for the. Um, for the post game press conference and the way that they all played off of each other, the way they were all joking with each other, you could tell. I mean, the, someone had said uh, something to one of them, and it was like an inside. It was about Tiara East's rebounding, and they had like an inside joke about like how she just watches the ball and she mm-hmm. doesn't go up and grab it, and like the way that all five of them, including Coach Richardson, laughed. Like just the way they play off of each other, you can tell how much fun they're having, and it's showing on the court as well. When they, when in a game where it doesn't feel like it's a blowout. Oh, it, it's not, it doesn't look like it's a blow, but it feels like it because of how well they play off each other. Yeah, she had that quote, right, where she said something to the effect of, like, they always tell me to stop watching, stop watching. Yeah. And that was her way of saying, like, I got to crash the boards. Exactly. This men's team in a bit of a different position, as we talked about. They are not sitting at the top of the conference standings, more toward the bottom, but they did break their 10-game losing streak by beating UTSA on Hooter's birthday on Sunday that's a story in and of itself. I'm a bad editor for not assigning a sidebar just about the, the mascots. Yeah, I I would have gladly written one for you, but I didn't get the call. So, See, the problem is, though, if Declan would have wrote the sidebar, the entire story would have been about Boomer. Or UD. Yeah. Or UD. Got my well, it would have been, it just went about those two. Sorry, Dad, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys have a... Ramirez tweet about T Bird <laughs> about T Bird was very funny. There's a lot of controversy there with T Bird. Had no idea who he was. <laughs> well, you know, we, but in fairness, they don't bring T Bird out a lot anymore. He's too edgy. He's too edgy too for edgy. the public. <laughs> they got to make sure he's contained. You guys were online yesterday looking at clips from a mascot camp, right? Which yeah, was in Harrisburg. Yeah. Very, very funny. We're uh, it's Keystone mascots. Shout out, no free shout outs to Keystone mascots. We have more but... free shout outs on this show. Than... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I keep arguably Stone, any podcast in America. I don't yeah, I have no way of quantifying that. I was but we'll just say, say a lot of podcasts. Keystone uh, Keystone mascots though deserves a shout out. They were uh, they they were out in full force on at Hooters' birthday. So did you guys have a favorite mascot? Sunday, well, maybe one that you didn't know about. The Barbera Bear was a little bit of a diva to me, and I wasn't super <laughs> thrilled about that. You know, I went up to to take a picture, and and they were not willing to do that. So I'm not a fan of the Barbera Bear. After maybe because they knew you were being unprofessional, you wanted a picture. They're maybe they're like, aren't you on the clock here working? Well, they're on the clock too, and they're you know what they're on the clock to do to to please the people in attendance, and they just did not do that. So, you know, after years of me. Being the biggest fan of the the commercials, you know, is Barbera's on the Boulevard the best boy, I guess, you know? Have you ever bought a car from Barbera's on the Boulevard? John, I have a hard enough time buying meals, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I can't afford a car, okay? But well, maybe I'll never do it now. Has your family ever bought a car it? from Barbera's on the Boulevard? No, no. Maybe they need to head down there. No, or absolutely up there from not. where they are. Yeah. No, why would you go to anywhere that isn't Delaware to buy a car? Are they the best? Oh boy, I guess. Oh God, oh we should Lord. we should quit while we're ahead. Um, <laughs> so you guys obviously had a good time with the mascots. How did Temple snap this ten game losing streak again? They didn't do it in dominant fashion, but for the first time in a long time, they closed out a game. And again, at the end of the day, this is not going to win the conference tournament for them. It's not going to get them certainly to the NCAA tournament. But they just just needed a win. They just needed to. Again, fans won't care about this. But I think Adam Fisher and his staff will for a team where th- this could have really gotten wildly out of control. They could be losing these games by 20 or 30 points. They have fought hard in a lot of these games as much as I hate writing and saying fought hard. They finally got something to crack for them. Did benefit from an ejection and a, and a, and a, a, a point guard not playing uh, you know, more minutes than he was going to. And again, I wasn't there for, for, well, I wasn't there for that game and, and wasn't there for that dust up certainly. But Tell me about how this came together, guys. What did Temple do differently to, to close out this game and get this win? I think everyone contributed, and they got quality minutes from everyone who played, except Quante Berry, who got hurt. He was out, like, the second, like, beginning of the second half or, like, toward the first, end of the first, something yeah. like that. But everyone who was on the court played quality minutes and gave them quality minutes. Even Emmanuel Ogpomo, who, you know, rarely sees the floor unless they play. They're playing a team that is big, and UTSA is big. So the guards, specifically Zion Stanford, Jaleel White, Shane Dazoni. Shane Dazoni specifically because when they went into half, they were down by what, like, what was it, six, seven? Somewhere around there, yeah. And six, I believe, right? It was – 41 34, I think the score mm-hmm. was. This was seven. And Shane Dazoni just came out and like he he was he was hooping. He came out and he was hooping and helped them get back to where they were or get back to evening up the score. And from there, you know, Hasir Miller had a, a good second half. The team in general had a good second half. They they shot the lights out in the second half. Yeah, I think that was big too, just being able to see the ball go in the basket that's been something so huge for this team that they've just like have not experienced that as a team this season uh it was a big i think a big just confidence boost and uh, it was almost like a sigh of relief in the post game where uh where adam and heiser um and steve were sitting at the table and it just kind of seemed like they seemed relaxed for the first time and really since january 7th like it's it's been a while so you men, we mentioned it in the in the gamer you guys wrote um, that he mentioned it was just a chip off the shoulder. It was just kind of a you know they could breathe now, and I think that's so big, especially in a season where you know you're you're rebuilding, you're trying to find your pieces for the future. It's nice to have that sort of chip off your shoulder that you're not this historic losing team now. You you don't have that record. You you now have all the all the pressure off your shoulders to just go into the rest of the season with no expectations and just see if you can find some rhythm for next year. So I think that was probably the biggest takeaway. Yeah, Jordan Ivory Curry, interesting story. And again, this is becoming more common now. I played his first two seasons at UTSA, transferred to Pacific last season and came back to UTSA prior to, the, to, UTSA prior to this season. He had a game-high 22 points, played 32 minutes off the bench because Christian Tucker – 
got ejected when he got uh, when Jordan Ivory Curry and again I wasn't there what what happened there what what led to that I think it was more like it was Hysir fouled him and then Jordan Ivory Curry said something and then Hysir shoved him yeah he got in his face in the UTSA bench and Hysir look okay this is not me being a homer all right I'm not a homer you see the replay, and it's very clearly a little, you know, like, get off me. Yeah. And it's a flop. He flopped. Right, no, he 100% did. You know, he flopped for sure. And yeah. I have nothing nothing wrong with drawing a foul. Get no problem with that. Get the call. But that is a, you know, it was, I think it was a lot more than what it really was. It got blown out of proportion a little bit. But yeah. And Christian Tucker comes off, leaves the bench. That's what led to, to his ejection. So a temporary reprieve for Temple. I don't even think he deserved to, like, no. get um, yeah, thrown up because he he ran to go help um, Ivy Curry up, so mm-hmm. it's not like he it was like to... a step or two. Like, yeah. It was not yeah. it was like a weird. Just it seemed like going back and watching it, just a, a weird sequence. It was a very letter of the law call, and I understand why they made it, but like, yeah. and I understand why the rule exists in the first place. By the way, but like, like first of all, I should say, but um, yeah, it was just kind of a weird. It was weird. Yeah, yeah. Weird. I don't think Hasir deserved the tech, and I don't think. Um, I forgot his name already. Ivy Walker. Curry. No. Walker. Who, yeah, Walker um, deserves yeah, to Christian get thrown Tucker. out. Oh, Tucker. Tucker. Why did I say Walker? Yeah. Christian oh, Tucker. I'm sorry if you're listening, Christian. I apologize. It might be. <laughs> 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 Christian Tucker. Yeah, so Temple now has uh, a lot of time to get back on the practice floor, prepare for Sunday's game at Wichita State, two-game road trip where they play at Wichita State, and then next Wednesday at Rice so, again, they, they could sweep Wichita State this year, and then they go back down to, again, play Rice, the team that, that beat them here earlier this season. All right, before we close things out in the mailbag, a football recruiting update to bring to you guys in case you missed it. Temple signed uh, Khalil Poti, a junior college player, originally from the Bronx, played at Frederick Douglass Academy, another addition to the defensive line for Everett Withers. So he played one season at Dodge City Community College after his freshman year at Nassau Community College. So some depth there. Again, we're going to be talking spring football before we know it. Jason Yevis from our staff talked to him. So reminder to check out that story on alscoop.com when you get a chance. Two mailbag questions to close us out here unless I am missing anything that came in late. I don't think I am. These are questions from... The Alscoop.com message boards. The first one is Stapler 01. When you're Stapler 01, what do you think of Declan? Uh, Milton, offense, office, office space. Office space, maybe. Yeah. Milton's listening. Who knows? Uh, maybe. I hope so. Guy's just looking for a stapler. Yeah, I hope he's enjoying his beach resort. Keeps getting his, yeah. <laughs> keeps getting uh, moved around, and then he gets the last laugh. Yes. Yeah, I that appreciate guy you. also plays Fuchs and Barry. I don't know his name. And, uh, it's hard to, to see those two different characters played by the same person. It's he's, he's also going to be on the scoop next week along with Le'Veon Bell. <laughs> That'd be pretty a cool. Packed episode. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Steve anyway, Stapler O1's question. With the, with the Lincoln Financial Field lease expiring soon, can you list and rank the options for where Temple might play going forward? I assume an extension is the likeliest option, but there could be others. We've talked about this in not, uh, not too long ago. I don't know what other options are out there. You know, it, it's they're kind of really hamstrung on this. So, not to cut this question short, but yeah, I, I don't really see any other any other options unless they're going to magically find a lot of money and a lot of goodwill with the North Philly community to build a stadium on campus. That Makes ship sense. has sailed. <laughs> I don't think they could ever think. get one. We'll see. Never say never, but yeah, I mean, it's a whole conversation for another time. Yeah. Uh, other question here to close things out. Should have brought this up with Andrew since he's a UVA grad. Ripple Owl is the screen name. What chance, if any, of Jeremy McKee committing to Temple? If you're asking me on Tuesday, February 20th, 2024, I would say the chances of Jeremy McKee committing to Temple are slim. I think if Aaron is the coach at Temple still, chances are pretty good. Not absolutely certain, but good. I think you're probably going to, and I, I mentioned Andrew because I think UVA is starting to to, to watch Jaron more and more. I think you could see him end up at like a Big Ten school, like a like a Northwestern, a real good student, good kid. 
Uh, I, I think that outwardly you might hear Aaron, you know, I think in conversation, I think Tem- uh, Aaron has said, hey, I'd love to, ideally, I'd love to see him end up at Temple, but it's going to be Jaron's decision. I, I, I would think in my heart of hearts that, that, that Aaron probably knows that Jaron's not going to come here. I'm sure it's going to spark the whole conversation of, oh, another legacy recruit that got away. He's a good basketball player. Just don't see it happening. But things change. I get mocked for it. Things are fluid in the world of recruiting. You do get a very good legacy recruit coming in next year in Dylan Batie. But Jeremy McKee, don't see it happening. So, I have a mailbag question. You do? I do. Declan Landis submitting a mailbag question. Yeah, I don't know if that's legal or not. But I do. Sure is. We don't have to. Is there a governing body that that the that, that oversees this podcast? I would other think than it's the, the, the other than the laws of common decency, you know, just the L Scoop Council. Yeah, but I I've never met him, so I, I haven't know. either. It's secret. <laughs> um, but I think you know, with with Rymer's tweet over the weekend, and obviously being Hooter's birthday, he talked about T Bird, and that led us down sort of a uh, a rabbit hole. But I think my not I think I know my mailbag question <laughs> to you guys is uh, what defunct or retired mascot do you want to see make a return? Whether it's a short run, whether it's a more permanent sort of position, you know, in the mascotting world. Is there anybody that comes to mind that you want back in the game? Weren't we talking about on another episode, weren't we talking about Big Shot and I got Big Shot and Hip Hop mixed up? Yes, we were because we were talking about the, the Hunger Games question. And yeah, I took Hip Hop. Big Shot, well... well Big Shot was hilarious. This overweight blue ball of fur with like the receding orange hairline. I would say him. I don't. That's the one that jumps out at me. I I do enjoy that game. Like I said, I was telling you guys a story yesterday about this kid who literally was like trying to literally like hurdle over me to get to the court (laughs) because he was just beside himself, wanted to meet the, the Philadelphia Federal Credit Union mascot. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> and this father did not care that his son was like just unintentionally kind of like almost like assaulting me. And I want to be like, buddy, it's it's the PFCU account. I myself am a PFCU customer. Great institution, great credit Congrats. union. <laughs> but, it's big <laughs> news. Just a full disclosure. Yeah, big, big news. news. <laughs> Biggest news to drop on the scoop this week. But I just remember, it, it is funny to see how much kids just lose their collective minds with the mascots. But if if Big Shot all of a sudden – just trot it out on the court. I, I that would have been that would have been uh, awesome. It's a good answer. Prime here doesn't uh, care. Yeah, uh, I, not that I don't care. I'm just not. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, man. I could see it in my face. first ever mailbag question. I'm not too whatever, bro. I'm not well versed in the world of mascots. So and that's your right. You don't have to be. All my favorite mascots haven't retired. So. <laughs> It's well, who are your favorite mascots then? Since well, you don't want to play along, Declan is just really trying to shoehorn this into the end of the scoop here. Well, sweet. and we love him for it. First off, favorite mascot or the mascot of my favorite team, unfortunately. Um, I like Rocky, the the um, Nuggets mascot. Mm-hmm. Benny the Bull is cool. Nah, Benny the Bull's washed. <laughs> He's washed. Benny the Bull, <laughs> mid two thousand tens. Probably the greatest mascot on earth at that time. Now, I just he's not showing me anything recently. <laughs> mm. Declan, I feel like you have you have a, an answer that you really want to like that you're just I do you I can see it in your face. Yes. You have that anticipatory glow. Yeah. Well, the obvious so answer for don't, me don't disappoint us. The obvious answer for me is T Bird, right? That's funny. But I think there <laughs> right. is no better mascot right now to come back than Baby Owl. I I think Who in we my, referenced earlier on the show. Yeah, I don't think we've talked about Baby Owl yet. Actually, I thought we had. We, I we talked T-Bird. about T Bird. We talked about T Bird. We have not brought up Baby Owl. We didn't talk about Baby Owl earlier. I don't no. believe so. And Put if we did, if my memory, if we did, we did, <laughs> if we did, we did not give Baby Owl the respect they deserve. Because oh my goodness, in our research this weekend, we've uh, we uncovered Baby Owl and. Uh, you know, I've I've seen them around maybe like once or twice, but I just think it's just a wild costume. Mm. <laughs> like the level, seeing the level of design that went into Hooter and then the level of design that goes into T-Bird, who T-Bird, by the way, never seen before until mm-hmm. Sunday. Mm-hmm. And then to see Baby Owl, who, if you do a quick little, do a, do a quick little Google up. search of, of Baby Owl. Up. 
is research. probably the most depressed mascot I've ever seen. Yes. And it's just like, for some reason, the, the eye on Baby Owl is like, <laughs> is curved up. So it looks like it's crying the whole time. And I just, I love, I love Baby Owl for it. I think it's a beautiful thing. And then you can turn it into a marketing thing with, you know, so many new head coaches on campus, you know, so many young teams. Baby Owl, next generation, boom. We just got to fix the face a little bit so it's a little more positive. (laughs) But I think Baby Owl, you can, you could do a whole marketing pitch around that. I'm in a PR class right now. I don't know if you could tell, but I think you can, can. you can do a whole bunch of social media content coming around Baby Owl. And I just, I just, I think it's you're hilarious. out of gas. You're, I feel like you're about to cry. I almost feel like feel like it's your so eyes are a little funny. glazed well, a little think bit. I'm right? gonna cry. Yeah. You should see baby owl. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But yeah, that's uh, we got it. We have to. We kind of have to like remind ourselves next week to ask Kyle about the mascots. Like this is just Kyle content. Like he 100. percent Yeah, we need him to chime in. But uh, that baby owl for it feels like we're leaving money on the table here. Not you need to watch. You need to watch Blades of Glory, particularly the first like ten minutes of it, where Will Ferrell is playing a mascot, and it's just it's just very funny. I will. Uh, I'll keep that in mind for this week. You won't. You won't That'll be my homework. Yeah. Once I get my laptop back, if I as I always it. say, when is this la- this laptop it's supposed to be done today? So he said that a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah, they did. Was sent away to like East Jabip somewhere, like this laptop. Not sure where that is, it. but I'd nobody knows. Back That's by why then. it's challenging. <laughs> I probably would have gotten it back. Yeah, tracking number on there. that thing. No, no, I uh, I know that I know that they uh, got it on yesterday, but wouldn't hold a charge. And I was like, would it just be easier to get a new one? He said, No, no, no. So mm. here we are, waiting for a phone call that will probably never come. Jesus, I think you'll get it back. Hopefully, <laughs> I hope so. Wow. I hope so. I hope so. Let's not end on a, on a on a down note like that. Declan's going to get his laptop back next week. We'll talk a little bit more about mascots. We'll talk about the men's and women's basketball teams. Any recruiting updates that we have to pass along. Again, a big thank you to Andrew Hope for the great NIL conversation. Thanks for sticking with us for another episode. We'll talk to you guys next week.